Um, but now that you have mentioned some of the happenings that, that have been going on, let's talk about what that $4.3 billion gorilla in the room is, is, is going to be. What, do you, what, what is that? First of all, what's that? Just to make sure that I understand it correctly. Yeah, so it's very interesting because it's, it's, it's basically a signal that the U.S. government is sending out that they need to deglobalize the nuclear fuel supply chain from Russia. That's essentially what it means. And, and so if I want to, you know, unpack that for you, uh, over the last, um, how many years now, five, six, seven years, the nuclear industry in, uh, in the United States has gone through a very difficult time. Um, you know, power plants uh, have struggled because they don't, they don't get a lot of financial support up until recently. The mining sector, if you want to start up the upstream, you know, the mining sector is basically shut in on the United States. So Think about this for a minute. You know, the U.S. reactors need about 50 million pounds of U-308 every year. 21,000 pounds were put out, pulled out of the ground in the United States last year. So all the mines are on care and maintenance. So you have no primary production. So is that, the, is that a problem? Absolutely. But is that the biggest problem? No, not even close. The biggest problem is your conversion and enrichment facilities in the United States have largely been either shut down or curtailed because uh, uneconomic pricing for so long. So there's a facility in, in uh, Metropolis, Illinois uh, called Commerdine. The, the plant there has been closed since 2017. So where, where have US utilities partially filled that void? Well, they've been buying services from Russia. So, you know, fast forward to February 24th, invasion of Ukraine happens, the world wants to pivot away from Russian fuel supplies, whether it's, you know, coal, nat, gas, palladium, uranium services, and there's no idle, there's no capacity, all the capacity is idle. So you have this kind of conundrum where these plants that have been closed for four or five, six years, or have been running at a limited capacity, need to amp up, ramp up, and they're basically saying, look, we're not going to ramp up and make these huge investments, which they require, without having long-term commitment contracts from utilities. So the government has realized that there's this, this dilemma here. And I think the signal I'm taking away is they're coming in and they're trying to facilitate that transition. They can't just cut themselves off of Russian enrichment and conversion services because there isn't enough capacity in the West like there's a it's a wean off strategy so they want to wean them off and they're going to help facilitate that process with funding i don't know how the utilities are reacting um you know i was just at the at the world uh, nuclear fuel conference earlier this week in montreal and there was a bear, there was definitely a, a, a kind of a somber mood at the conference because they need to pivot away from from russia uh in terms of these services uh, but there's no there's no capacity to do it overnight. It's going to take probably a year or two to restart uh, a lot of these these uh, these facilities that have been uh, closed or, or, or basically operating at less than 100% capacity. So it's, it's a real conundrum for the sector. And I think the government is kind of stepping in and, and trying to figure out, you know, how to facilitate that transition. Hmm. Exactly. Because, and what I'm getting from you is that even if, because it still has to pass some signatures basically uh you know bureaucracy in the government has to be some, some you know more people have to sign off on it before they can get the funding and they have to actually get the funding this was just a news of them seeking that money if i'm getting correctly yeah absolutely it's, it's gonna take uh, it's gonna take you know the government uh, you know there's a long process to go through but they basically requested the funds how the legislation or the bill or whatever the processes in Congress works through is, is, is to be determined and the devil will be in the details. So, you know, I think, I think what you can take away from it is at this point is that the government is sufficiently concerned that the, the that their fleet of reactors could get cut off some of these services. Um, and again, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there's been very few utilities that have self have publicly self-sanctioned, uh, meaning they've come out and said, look, we're not, we're not honoring contracts we've made with Russian suppliers uh, for conversion and, and uh, in, enrichment. And, and the reality is there's been very few of those that have publicly said we're self-sanctioning. And, and uh, you know, my belief is they don't, have, they don't have a plan B. 
they don't, <laughs> okay, they don't have plan B. It made me think for a second there, not healthy for me. But so it, I also saw someone asking like, if this is not, if not, if it's not passed yet, and if it's specifically the U.S., why are all the uranium stocks across the globe basically running? And I think what you're coming down to is saying that this is showing the sentiment on a very high branch within the government. Is that, am I getting it correctly? Yeah, for sure. But I think it, it highlights the, the concern. I mean, let, let's put it like, let, let's put it this way. Uh, governments don't generally want to intervene in a lot of free markets and commodity markets. Um, you know, the free markets work pretty well. So when a government decides to step into something, something is going on uh, that they're concerned about. So I think that's thing one. Um, thing two is uh, why things are getting, uh, why things are, 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 are uh, appreciating value is because of the fundamental belief that you cannot restart idle capacity, whether it's a mine or a conversion facility without higher incentive pricing and long-term contracts. Um, the industry has gone through that in the past and, and they paid dearly for building a lot of capacity without end customers. And, you know, I, I heard, I heard some of these, uh, uh, conversion enrichment facilities, um, you know, representatives of those companies speak at the conference and they made it very clear, we're not restarting and we're not ramping up capacity unless we've got long-term contracts in place. So you have to get those contracts in, in place and you need to get the pricing in place. Otherwise they won't make the investments because there's a reason why these places are closed. They're, they're, they weren't economic at the current prices. So it's a signal that prices have to go up. I mean, what's the price that the market will need for some of these U.S. Um, US uh, mines to come back online. I mean, I don't know because it's, a, it's always a case by case basis, but mm. at $50 a pound, you're starting to see some producers signal restarts of existing shut-in capacity, whether it's Cameco or Boss Energy or Paladin. The reality is, is that there are, there are other deposits in the world that will come online, but it won't be at 50, it could be at 60, it could be at 70. And then you're talking about, okay, what about, what about greenfield projects? So late, you know, whether they're exploration or late stage development projects, what's the incentive price in order for them to build a new mine? Well, it's not 60 or 70, I guarantee you that because the, the cost of everything, um, capital equipment, people, and all of that has obviously gone up significantly uh, with the inflation environment we're in right now. So this is what people are, are trying to build models around, you know, around this, what's this cost curve look like at each company and each mine site? And how is supply going to respond to higher incentive pricing? We see this with every commodity. As the price goes up, there's a bigger incentive for new supply to come on. The big reality, though, is that this marketplace, you know, just went through a nine-year bear market. And so you wipe out a lot of capacity during those bear markets. And then all of a sudden you realize you need to have all this capacity back online and it's not so easy. So it's, right. it's going to take time. It's going to take time. And I think that's what everyone's looking for these signals, you know, whether it's, it's companies raising money so they can restart operations or further, de further development projects. Um, it's all starting to happen. And I think that's why investors are starting to get interested in the sector after essentially a nine year break where nobody really cared about the sector other than a small handful of very deep value contrarian investors. But we're seeing more and more generalists you know, coming to us and asking us about, you know, what are we seeing in the marketplace, um, trying to understand the market dynamics, uh, because, you know, essentially uh, the world has kind of woken up to this, this, this uh, reality that we have that, that our energy systems are, 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 are quite susceptible to disruption. Hmm. Okay. And right, right, right. This, um, I definitely wanted to ask you more about that. I'm going to just one point that to, to your point, I spoke to Jeff Glenda out of UR, um, your energy fair disclaimer on his confession. I own his stock, so I should be considered biased. But he told me, I guess about six months ago, that for him to even start thinking about going uh, into production, he'd need 60 to $65. What's that now, though, today with gas, uh, you know, with, 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 um, with gas going up into, into like the $10? Um, a gallon and stuff like that, and maybe even higher. Possibly that price is even higher. But even if it were only sixty dollars, only sixty-five dollars, right? That's still thirty percent higher than the the price of uranium today. So that's a, that's a very important point to be made. And I also saw a video, I guess from twenty eighteen, from somebody saying why they wouldn't buy uranium. I guess that was a bad call. Uh, they should have. 
but they said something like, you know, next gen's got that huge deposit. Whenever the price hits the right moment, they're going to start, you know, they're going to swamp the market with pounds. How long is it going to take for companies that have that high grade uranium, you know, up in Canada and the US to, to really legislate their projects and, and, and you know, um, permit their projects to go into production, to, to start building it, go into production and, and do all that thing. And I think it's exactly that window, which is probably going to be a long, a long period. I don't know what you think about it, but I think it's going to be that period that is really the opportunity for investors. Is that, is that what you think, John? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, Sprott, Sprott is very actively involved in mining for a long time. So, I mean, I'm not a, a mining person, but, um, you know, I've, I've been at Sprott for, for 12 years and I've, I've obviously learned a lot over that time. And, and one of the things I think a lot of investors don't appreciate is how long it takes uh, to actually define a deposit, um, go through all the permitting process, uh, raise the capital, construct it, and then actually, you know, get cash flow starting. I mean, it's not uncommon for that to be 12 to 15 years. So let's just think about that for a minute. The last, uh, you know, other than the last 12 months, if you go the last 12 months and then the nine years prior, the whole sector was basically shut in and going through a, a severe retrenchment. And so we've kind of, we're kind of one year into this recapitalization cycle not a lot happens in a year. Um, yes, you can start raising some capital to get uh, it previously operating assets back online, which we're starting to see. But you, when, you, when you think about those assets coming back online, even those ones are like one to two years out. And when you look at the pounds that they're projected to provide, it, it's really modest relative to the supply gap. Hmm. So yeah, you can start you know building a, a supply profile and, and you quickly figure out that um, you know, as, as, as Leo, the CEO of NextGen uh, will say, you, you need several arrow sized deposits over the next, you know, 10 years to come into production and meet, to meet uh, the forecasted demand for uranium. Right. So it's, it's a very slow process. Um, the permitting process, the environmental, the social license, um, these things take an enormous amount of time. You know, I was on a panel with him a few weeks back and he was talking about <clears throat> they were getting ready to upload 10,000 pages of documents as part of their permitting process. It is not easy to build, to, to get mines approved and then to build them. Uh, these are in very remote locations, obviously, as well. So um, the supply response is coming, but it's, it's, it's going to be very slow. Mm, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, oh, thanks for that overview. Oh, I, I do want to go back to the point that you made about sentiment and about general, more generalist investors getting interested into the space. Um, because I know that in, in previous interviews, you've said that in, in, you know, a few years ago, like in 2016, 2017, sort of at the bottom, um, you've tried sitting down with like institutional money managers and, and people like that. And, and, and talking about commodities was basically a no-go. That's what you said in an interview and especially uranium. Are you now being approached by them? Like, are they coming to you or do you still have to chase them down? How do you experience that sentiment? Yeah, I would, I would say as early as two years ago, I mean, it was very difficult to talk to many institutions about commodities in general. And, and why is that? Well, because just about everything else in the world was working very well, you know, whether it was, excuse me, fang stocks or, um, you know, uh, the bond market, everything was kind of rallying as interest rates were zero and, and money was being printed by central banks around the world. Uh, there was real no reason uh, to own commodities. Uh, fast forward to today, now we're in a stagflationary environment and COVID kind of exposed the vulnerabilities that we've created over the last 10 years by <clears throat> underinvesting in a lot of commodity sectors. A lot of capacity has been gone. There hasn't been incentive pricing. And all of a sudden, these supply chains get, get disrupted. There's a demand spike and there's no supply response. And so this is why a lot of commodity prices have come out of the doldrums. Commodities generally do well in stagflationary environments um, or inflationary environments um, as, as capacities kind of comes back online and, 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 you know, commodities generally are inflation sensitive or sensitive assets. Institutions, I would say, are, are, are coming back to commodities slowly, but they're coming back to uh, energy related commodities, I'd say, quicker because of, of, of uh, the crisis that's going on. In, in Russia and in, in, in Ukraine because of the invasion by Russia and obviously the 
uh, you know, I would say Europe is kind of at the at the at the at the at the front end of this energy crisis that we're experiencing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, energy costs have been through the roof over here, so that's a big one as well. I also wanted to ask you about your overall outlook on the timeline of all this, knowing that maybe not everybody who would be a buyer of uranium is already a buyer of uranium. Meaning, there's a you know that that's what you just told me that there's a lot of place for them to start coming in. But what about yourself? I mean, with, with Sput, because you're sitting on a lot of money right now that you've been raising, yet you've not really been going into the market. Are you allowed to talk about why, why not, and, and when, and all that? Yeah, I mean, we have a very simple strategy. You know, we, we try to raise money on an accretive basis, and then we try to look for the best offers that we can find in the marketplace to buy physical uranium and physical uranium is a, is a very different market than other commodity markets. Um, we can buy huge amounts of gold and silver with very little trouble. Um, buying uranium is a lot more work. It's a lot more hand to hand in terms of dealing with uh, different traders and producers and different time zones. So, you know, we've generally held cash anywhere from kind of one to 4%. Right now, given the influx of money that we just received, we're probably at the higher end of that that range right now. Um, but we're you know we're back to buying again. We bought three hundred thousand pounds uh, the other day, and uh, you know we're going to continue to do what we've done since day one, which is look for the best offers we can find. It's a pretty simple strategy, uh, but it takes time. Um, it's not a deep liquid market, um, and and, that, and the reason for that is because a lot of the the pounds are earmarked for utilities and utilities. Uh, buy in the term market. So not a lot of material comes into the, into the spot market. We have to kind of find it every month. Uh, there is always material that comes into the spot market, but it's it's kind of lumpy, comes and goes. Um, so that's the process. And um, obviously every night we update our website and t- Twitter is, is very good at watching and updating what we're doing every day. So it right. always amazes me. Um, but, you know, we're going to just continue what we're doing. It's uh, It's worked so far. It, yeah, that that right there, the last sentence is is worth the conversation, in my opinion, because Twitter exactly, Twitter looks at what you're doing, but there's a lot of speculation going on as well. You know, people would say, oh, no, they're waiting for the end month slam or whatever. There's just people would say everything. But in the end, when you're asked these questions, you, you always give like sort of the same answers, like we're just going to do what we do. And this is what we do. And then you actually go ahead and do it, which is very simple. Um, so I like the simplicity of it. Have you experienced the spot market becoming more difficult, though, since you started picking up pounds uh, about almost a year ago? Yeah, I mean, the spot market is very hard to figure out at times because, as I said, it's it's uh, every day is different. Um, some days people have all kinds of stuff to, that they're willing to sell us. Other days people have nothing that they're willing to sell us. And a lot of it is about incentive pricing. You know, we talked about incentive pricing for a miner in terms of production. There's also an incentive price for an individual that holds uranium. What's the price that I'd be willing to sell my uranium to somebody? Uh, There's lots of people that are willing to sell once it hits a certain incentive price. So generally what we've seen is the price goes up. You'll see some more pounds kind of come out of the woodwork. I think it's also fair to say that a lot of the pounds that we call kind of legacy pounds, secondary pounds, that were being held by different investment funds and whatnot. whatnot. A lot of those pounds we've kind of purchased. Uh, We were very active buying a lot of those pounds from different investment funds. Um, So, you know, we think there are still some pounds out there, but, you know, I think the easy pounds have been been gobbled up by us. But like I said, every day is different. And we've got a great team uh, at WMC Energy, which is our technical advisor, uh, and they're basically, you know, in contact with all the different producers, traders, and intermediaries around the world, always trying to assess, you know, what's available, what kind of what kind of offer prices, what kind of delivery windows, and so it's a, it's a process of sorting through that and, and finding what we think are the best uh, the best available deals. Could you help me understand what happens if there's no deals, like if there is nothing out there for you to buy? What what happens with the money? What happens to the price of uranium too? Yeah, well, I would say there, there's always, as I said, there's always an incentive price that can be reached for somebody to finally call you and say, um, you know, willing to sell you my pounds. And we, we've got a list of people 
that are on our on our call list to you know constantly to touch base with to to find out when they're ready to sell. So, but it's but but you know I think you're raising a good point is that it's it is a tight market. It's it's and it's it's a tight market because as I said earlier, most of the pounds are earmarked for for long term utility contracting. You know the spot market was always a home for all the pounds that didn't have that didn't have a, a long term contract associated with them. And that was one of the reasons that the market was somewhat suppressed because, you know, these producers uh, didn't sign long-term contracts and then they would get dumped in the market. And, uh, you know, if there was no buyer, it could put pressure on the price, obviously. So what we've seen in the last few months is utilities have stepped down their their buying in the spot market. It was always a, a very minor part of their procurement strategy. And a lot of them have have pivoted back to what they're more comfortable with and more traditional for them, which is buying on long-term contracts. And, you know, if you listen to Cameco's uh, results in the last few months, you'll you'll get a pretty strong signal from them that they've been big big beneficiaries of utilities coming to them to lock in, lock in long-term contracts. So utilities, I think, are finally responding. Um, They've seen the price increase. They've seen the, the supply disruptions and, the, the threats of sanctions and and, and uh, reverse sanctions by Russia to to act as catalyst to say look the market's changed the, the days of me going to the market and buying uranium at twenty eight bucks as much as I wanted are long gone now. <laughs> well, actually, get all the cash that you're holding, if if the if if the people selling uranium to you know it and they do because it's public information, wouldn't that incentivize them to? be like, no, I don't have that much uranium. I don't want to sell it to you unless you pay me 75 bucks. Is that, could that ever happen? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, it's, it's the market is a lot more stable than you think. Um, the, the market is, is, you know, yes, it's, it's not as liquid and, and the, the pricing is not as tight as you see for other, other commodities, but it, it doesn't work like that. If people don't want to sell, they don't want to sell. Um, but as I said, people have all kinds of financial incentives. Uh, whether they're traders that have to, to sell or whether they're investment funds that want to take a profit on their material because they bought it 28 bucks or, or whatever the case may be. So, um, you know, it's a free market. People, people have all kinds of reasons why they want to sell their material. And they do. I mean, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have been able to buy 37 million pounds. Hmm. Right, 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 right. And you're only going to keep looking for those pounds on the spot market. You don't intend on si- signing long-term contracts. No, I mean, we try to buy as short a delivery window as possible. And the reason for that is simple. The shorter the window, the less counterparty risk I have to deal with. Mm. So if you start going out in term and, 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 and whatnot, then you're talking about entering into all kinds of different uh, scenarios that you know may or may not happen. But if a material is available to short-term delivery, you'd always go for that first. See, that's why you're managing this fund and not me. Uh, John, I know you have to go. Uh, we're already over the time that you promised me. So uh, I'm going to let you go. Is there something, some last, whatever that you want to add here at the end? Yeah, listen, I would just say um, do your education, do your research, do your due diligence. Uh, try, to, try to stay away from going down too many rabbit holes uh, and stick to the fundamentals because there's a lot of news flow that's very positive right now in the sector and make decisions based on that. Not, uh, not a lot of noise. Exactly. Very well said. John Champagne, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.